the show on the road. Uh, good afternoon, thank you for coming. My name is Eric Street. I'm a faculty member of physics here at Griffith University. Uh, today we've got Jen Gustick. Did I do that right? Gust Gustick. Gustick. Oh. <laughs> it's fine. Everyone Always gets make it a mess of it. It's fine. Um, Just Jen. It's fine. Just Jen. <laughs> uh, so Jen joins us from NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C., in the United States. Uh, to talk about um, asteroid hunting and how you can help save the world, along with Jen. Um, she's a graduate of the University, University of Florida in aerospace and also a fellow alumni of MIT, along with myself. So take it away, Jen. Thank you very much, and thank you guys very much for having me. Um, I think to get through all the content, um, I'll present the stuff first and then try to get through it quickly so that we can have lots of Q&A time. Because I know folks probably have lots of questions on asteroids, but also other space stuff too. So feel free um, during the Q&A at the end to we'll start off with asteroid stuff, but um, we, I can certainly take other questions that might be of interest to you guys in space and technology too. Just be kind to me. Um, okay, so I'm here today to talk about um, asteroid hunting and uh, NASA's recent um, amplification of our work um, and focus on asteroids. So I am the Prizes and Challenges Program Executive in the Office of the Chief Technologist. That's a lot of words. What does that mean? So the Chief Technologist is one of three chiefs at NASA headquarters. There's a Chief Engineer that's responsible for safety and mission assurance on pretty much all of our missions and, and hardware. Um, a Chief Scientist who is the Chief Advocate and Strategist for all things science within the agency. We do Earth science, planetary science, heliophysics, um, and astrophysics um, and science topics uh, within NASA, as well as some uh, human health science as well. Um, and then there's the chief technologist, who is the um, chief advocate and um, advisor on all things technology for the agency. Um, and technology means a lot of things, so as you can imagine, that spans a lot of topics. Um, I am the program executive for prizes and challenges. What that means um, is uh, kind of some of the tools that we use to allow individual members of the public to participate in problem solving with NASA. So prizes, challenges, crowdsourcing, citizen science, all of those terms, some of which you've heard, are really tools for governments to be able to access individuals. In the past, we had to issue an RFP or a solicitation that basically just big companies or big universities would compete for, then they'd get a grant or a contract that NASA would fund to work through that big organization um, to solve some sort of problem or build something that uh, we needed to fulfill a mission. What prizes, challenges, crowdsourcing, and citizen science allow us to do is be able to tap into individuals and actually make a transfer of funds in some cases. So paying individuals through prizes um, to allow those folks to get involved, those entrepreneurs, those innovat innovators, those individuals, and not just the usual suspects be involved in aerospace um, topics. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, one specific program that NASA has that's a complete, like, 180 on the way we do business. It's this thing called the Asteroid Grand Challenge. So last year, we announced this Grand Challenge. NASA said to the world, issued a call to action to the world to say, let's find all asteroid threats to human populations and know what to do about them. And this is something, if you know anything about the way the programs work and get formed within any government, it takes years to actually be able to announce something, like you'll have been working on something for years <laughs> before you're actually allowed to talk about it publicly. And it just so happens that two months before we were planning to announce, this little guy came down uh, over Russia. So we took that as our sign that this was really what we were meaning. We were, we were suppo really supposed to do this. This was a nice, a nice reminder, a nice wake-up call. Um, but this uh, was, any of you guys see the, uh, uh, the dash cam footage from the Chetlins uh, asteroid last year? So this was a 17-meter asteroid uh, that entered very shallow um, over Russia and actually was an airburst asteroid. So what that means is it didn't actually impact the ground um, very much. I mean, they found, um, they found pieces of it, of course, on the ground, but it didn't explode on impact. It exploded in the air. And you, you might wonder, well, how, how does that happen? Why didn't, why didn't it meet the ground? There's a couple reasons why this particular asteroid didn't. One, it was relatively small. It was 17 meters. 
Um, and the conventional wisdom is that um, the smallest type of asteroid that could do real damage, like real damage to um, an area is 30 meters. So it's also te tested conventional wisdom a bit because this did real damage. Um, it, it actually caused a, a lot of injuries. Uh, people uh, heard the blast of the airburst. And if you hear a blast like that that you're not expecting to hear, a lot of people did what most of us would do. You, you walk to the window and you see what the heck just happened. And they walk to the window to see what happened. Shockwave comes and blows a bunch of glass in their face. Because um, the shockwave actually followed the sound. Um, that they didn't happen at the same time. And so the Chevalence ast asteroid was relatively small, 17 meters. Uh, second, it came in uh, at, a relative, at, a, at a pretty shallow angle. It didn't come straight down. So it had more atmosphere to go through. Went through quite a bit of atmosphere before it was about to hit the ground. Why is that important? These things are coming in so fast that they essentially create a column of super compressed air below them as they're moving in. And as soon as the pressure within that super compressed volume of air exceeds the integrity of the object, it basically the air blows the object up. The force from the air will blow the object back up. So that's what you saw. You saw um, the pressure, the super compressed air actually caused this to happen in addition to the friction of the speed of around the asteroid. Third, this was a carbonaceous asteroid. That means it was mostly made of carbon. Uh, carbon is more brittle than some other materials that uh, asteroids that can be made out of. So other asteroids are stony. Uh, uh, other asteroids are pure iron. That would have been very different if it was a pure iron asteroid um, as opposed to a carbon asteroid. So there's a lot of variance with the type of damage an asteroid can do based on size, based on entry angle, based on composition, and a number of other factors. Um, but Chevalinsk is a great um, illust illustration of just the, t the number of variants that um, asteroids uh, can have. And it's not just about, in, in order to, to achieve the grand challenge, it's not just about finding where all of these things are. It's really a four-part process in asteroid hunting. One, you have to find it, the initial detection. You have to detect it. Find that first uh, discovery of, of a new asteroid. But then you have to track it. If you see it once, that doesn't really do you any good because you don't know where it's going. And you don't know if you see it again in five years if it's the same one that you saw five years ago. You need to get an orbit on it. And to get an orbit on it, you need at least three measurements during that time that it's flying by the Earth um, on, its, on that pass by. So quickly, you need to get follow-up observations to get three vectors. For any of you that are aerospace folks or um, engineers, three vectors to determine a trajectory. You need to get at least three measurements on it to get a track. And the more you get, the better, because then you're getting a more accurate orbit. Then you have to characterize it. So if you detect it and track it, you know something's out there that you were able to see, and it's moving in this general orbit. You have no idea what its mass is, what it's made of, what its spin rate is, if it has cool things like moons or rings that now we've discovered some asteroids have, because they're really interesting uh, little bodies in and of themselves. Some of them have moons, some of them have rings like Saturn. Um, and then we, once we know what they're made of, what their mass is, spin rate, characteristics of them. Some of them are also rubble piles too, like kind of just light, like big popcorn balls that are just kind of lightly held together by gravitational forces. Um, so they, they all look very, very different. <coughs> Mitigation approach, so what you do about them, changes depending on what they're made of, how big they are, how fast they're moving. Um, you need, ultimately, you need to find them before we know what to do about them. And so, you guys probably heard the story 65 million years ago, dinosaurs had a bad day. <laughs> <laughs> and that also created today for us, because we might not be here if that bad day hadn't been created for the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Um, since I've started working on this particular topic of asteroids, I've actually gotten really nerdily into mass extinction reading. <laughs> um, and I've read a couple of books now on mass extinctions. And uh, I had always thought that this was like the only one on our planet. There have actually, this was actually the fifth mass extinction that our planet has experienced. Mass extinction defined as 75% of the species going away after a certain event. Uh, most of the time uh, that happens because of uh, collapses in food chain that results from things ranging from mega volcanoes to asteroids to, um, or a dominant uh, predator 
can also be um, uh, 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 one of the factors in mass extinctions. But this isn't the, the, the first, and it's probably not the last, mass extinction on the planet. Bye. The dinosaurs didn't have space programs. <laughs> <laughs> the dinosaurs couldn't see what was coming at them, literally. And that was a big asteroid. That asteroid was 10 kilometers, approximately. It was big. Um, and it hit around the Yucatan Peninsula and created what we know of as being the Gulf of Mexico today, basically. Huge, huge asteroid. Um, those things, we think that anything down to about a tenth the size of that, so down to one kilometer, uh, would be a bad day for the planet. So we call those planet killers, lovingly. <laughs> um, we know where the vast majority to a couple decimal places is of those objects. None of them are coming on an impact trajectory within at least the next 100 years, so nothing to worry about with planet killers. Whew. Hey, can all go home now? No. <laughs> um, but the reason why we say 100 years, too, is that orbits change. Uh, they get perturbed over time with things like the Yaporsky effect. It's the effect of the sun on some of these objects. And so we can predict about a year or 100 years out uh, with significant accuracy what the orbits of these objects are going to be. But it does take continued resilience and new measurements to fine tune their orbit over time. So it's not like we measure it once and we're done. You need to continue doing follow up observations and tracking those objects that are of the highest concern because their orbits could change um, over time. So one kilometer planet killers. Well, you get down to about 140 meters, like two, you're starting to talk in terms of football fields then um, in size. Um, 140 meters, that would be a bad day for a continent. So it wouldn't cause global damage, but it would be a, a really bad day for a continent. We know where about 60% of those are. Uh, when you get down to about 60 meters, that would be a bad day for a region like the east coast of the United States. And you get down to about 30, and that would have significant, uh, significant impact <laughs> in a city like New York, city killer. If it landed wrong place, 30 meter asteroid could do real damage to a city. When we get down to 30 meter objects, we know where less than 1% of them are. So um, the reason why these statistics are important is to show you just how many asteroids there are out there. There are a ton. It's a really busy neighborhood. There are a lot of them out there. Um, and what's so unique about this na potential na natural disaster is this is actually one that we could have some control over and we could do something about. Earthquakes, hurricanes, volcano eruptions, those types of activities are very, very difficult to get an accurate prediction on and see them happen before they're happening accurately. Right? We get better and better with our models, but a lot of that is modeling. What we're talking about here is something that we can actually do. We can know where all these objects are and eliminate this from the list of worries of our children and our grandchildren and their children. Which to me seems like a remarkable opportunity to do something for the future of humanity. To just eliminate this as an issue. Because if we know where these things are far enough ahead of time, we can move them. There are plenty of mitigation strategies that are out there. We can talk about them a little bit later. Gravity tractor, kinetic impactor, um, paintballing the side of them, change their mass slightly and encourage the Yaworski effect. There's a lot of things that you can actually do to these things far enough out that you move them enough that by the time they were going to get to the Earth, the Earth is no longer there because their trajectory has changed just slightly enough. So we can be smarter than the dinosaurs. This gives you a sense of how what we found in these different size classes. This is a graphic that was put together by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So the Jet Propulsion Laboratory is a NASA <coughs> contractor that um, runs our near-Earth object program. So we fund them to do a lot of the orbit determination um, and tracking of known, um, known asteroids. So these are near-Earth asteroids. Um, that are known when they're, they're full. These are the discovery rate, the amount of them that we know of. Um, and then the predicted amount that we think are out there um, uh, are the ones that are green that are left over. Now these are just near-Earth asteroids. These mean that they're not in the asteroid belt, which asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, um, there's lots of them there, super abundant. These are ones that actually are in an orbit around the sun where they come close to the Earth occasionally. Potentially hazardous asteroids are a subclass of this. So these are asteroids that come within one AU, one astronomical unit of the Earth. So ones that we need to 
um, watch more because they come closer than just near Earth. They're in a trajectory that could be potentially hazardous. There's about 1,400 known potentially hazardous asteroids at this point that we're actively tracking. Um, a great uh, Twitter account to follow um, is Asteroid Watch. It's run by the folks out at JPL, and they actually tweet whenever there's an asteroid flyby that's happening. If you want to go out in your backyard with a telescope and try to observe it, try to see it, um, they post information like that um, when, when they're coming by. So why the focus on asteroids? Well, NASA has actually, for quite a while, since 1998, had a uh, near-Earth object observation program. So since 1998, we've been looking for these things. Um, then we started with the big ones, obviously, right? You're going to start with the, the most risky part. So that's why we know where most of the big ones are, and as we get down in size, we know where less and less of those are. Not just because it's technically more difficult to observe smaller objects, because they're more dim, um, but also uh, because they would do less global damage. So we wanted to tick off the big ones first, right? That's why we've, we've started with the big ones. But uh, NASA's not only focused on the grand challenge side of why asteroids are interesting to protect our planet from them, because they do hit us from time to time. And not just with the, with the displays, literally the, the ball of flames that you saw last year in Russia, but they're pretty abundant. I mean, how many, any of us could go online and buy a meteor from me, meteor, meteorite men and a, a bunch of the different vendors that sell meteorites. Meteorites are asteroids, they're space rocks that just made it down to the ground and there, there's a bunch of them, you can go buy them. You can have, own your own asteroid. So they make their way down to Earth relatively often, just not necessarily in pieces big enough to do real damage. Um, but also, they're not, just, so they're not just a potential threat. Asteroids are also an incredible opportunity for mm -hmm. humanity. And so NASA has put together an initiative around asteroids that we announced last year that's not just about finding these objects to protect our planet from them but also about thinking about asteroids as potential um, destinations for future human missions, and also as potential uh, sources of resources um, on our expansion out into the universe. So what that means is um, two things. One, uh, if you were to imagine loading up your car today on a family trip and driving to Perth, <laughs> which would be fun in its own right, um, but having to take all of the oil with you that you need for that trip. All of, the, all of the petrol that you would need with you for that trip, hitching it on the back. That's how we do space exploration right now. We take all of the oil, all of the power, all of the propulsion fuel that we're gonna need for any trip with us from Earth. We don't use the stuff in space to our advantage. So many think um, that we could actually mine and create fuel stations off things like asteroids. Kind of the cosmic uh, BP station. <laughs> um, before you hopscotch off to the next stop. So when you think about in situ resource utilization, or actually using resources in space, in space resources for in space purposes, they become very attractive from a resource perspective for space exploration. But also, many companies believe, companies like Planetary Resources and Deep Space Industries, um, that have formed within the last couple years, many companies believe they can go and mine those things <laughs> and bring resources, rare earth resources, back to the planet that we're currently in a rare earth metal state for. So planetary resources intends to go and find titanium, platinum, other rare earth metals on asteroids and bring them back to the earth because we also need them here. Just because they're rare on earth doesn't mean that they're rare everywhere. But in order for them to do what they need to do, they also need to prospect, right? They're doing prospecting, they need to understand where uh, there's the most potential value of going. Asteroids are all over the place. It takes a long time to get to them. You don't want to send, you don't necessarily want to send a big mining operation to a carbon, to a carbon asteroid. It's not going to bring you much value home. Maybe some scientific value, maybe some tech demo value, but not necessarily the metallic value that they're looking for. So these companies also have an interest in understanding what these things are made of. We need to understand what they're made of to mitigate against them and also to be able to plan for human missions to them. When we attach a spacecraft to one, uh, we want to make sure, we want to know pretty darn sure um, that what we're attaching our, our astronauts to is not a rubble pile, um, but might be something more substantial um, and interesting uh, to, to justify a human mission to one of those objects. 
So they're not just a threat, they're an opportunity. And they're, the reason that we've packaged these together into the Asteroid Initiative is because in order to do both of these things, Asteroid Mission and Grand Challenge, these are the things kind of in NASA's bucket, but you could also put like asteroid mining down here and that's more of a, like a commercial <coughs> thing. Um, everyone needs to know where they are, where they're going, and what they're made of in order to do this activity. So current contributors to the cause, back on the Grand Challenge, um, uh, venturing away from the mission. NASA has been doing this, like I said, has been looking for asteroids, doing asteroid hunting through traditional scientific methods since 1998. And they found a lot of these. They do that for making grants to big ground-based observatories, um, like the uh, Catalina Sky Survey, which actually has um, uh, a telescope here in Australia as well. Um, and the Linear Telescope, which is up at MIT Lincoln Labs. And also PANSTARS, which is in Hawaii. These are ground-based assets. So the way that these work is we look up at the night sky, we take a bunch of pictures in the night sky, and if we see something move in the image, stars aren't going to move. We know where the stars are in a particular image in a given evening. Where, but if you see something fast moving across the object, like uh, across the image like a streak, that's either an asteroid, a comet, maybe a spent rocket stage from the Apollo era, it's something that's moving orbital debris, space junk, um, but it's something that might require some tracking. It, it, it gets on our radar when we see a moving object. The other way that we can find, and these are mostly um, optical, or uh, in, the, in the optical spectrum, so you're taking pictures of things you can see, they're visual. Um, NEO WISE, this WISE mission, this uh, spacecraft, was actually, uh, this was the, a wide field survey that they did primarily for astrophysics. Uh, uh, purposes um, a few years ago, it was taking infrared imagery uh, to look deep back uh, into the universe. They, they found, um, because also it's very useful to use infrared wavelengths to detect asteroids, if you imagine painting that wall black and putting a piece of coal in front of it and then trying to spot the coal on that black wall, it would be very, very hard to see with your own eyes. Very, very hard to see. But Asteroids will give off a bit of a heat signature. And so with IR, with infra infrared, we can actually see, see the heat of the asteroids. Um, and so what they did with the NEOWISE mission is they actually took this particular spacecraft and found a lot of uh, near-Earth asteroids using an IR detection method from space. So this was a space-based asset that was being used to do asteroid hunting as well. But it wasn't initially intended to be for asteroid hunting. This is the ingenuity of scientists. <laughs> scientists will figure out how to get all sorts of stuff out of data that it was not originally planned for in order to get, a, in order to harvest as much value as they possibly can out of that activity. So these are kind of the traditional professional observation approaches. This is how the professionals that are being funded, mostly through universities across the globe, are doing asteroid hunting. This is a map. Uh, obviously. Uh, <laughs> this is a map um, that shows where the uh, majority of the data observations that are being provided to the Minor Planet Center are coming from. So the Minor Planet Center is like the central warehouse storage, uh, storage unit for all um, uh, Minor Planet data. Minor Planets include comets, asteroids, uh, dwarf planets. It includes a lot of different types of things. Um, they uh, so these, these this data is for all minor planet data. It's not just asteroid data. But in uh, 2012, 46 different countries provided observations to the MPC. Um, you can see the statistics about what came from Australia there. So uh, about 112,000 observations were reported in 2013. 2,400 of those were from Australia. What I find the most interesting is that half of those, even more than half of those, were from amateurs. So they weren't from professional observers. So you have a lot of amateur observers, maybe your friends, that are going into their backyard and taking measurements and reporting those to the Minor Planet Center. And they're getting added to the database, the official database, for what we know about all of these objects, um, what the globe knows about all of these objects. Now. 
23 of these um, observations were new discoveries. They were things we didn't previously know existed before. That seems small, but let me tell you why these, these additional members, uh, number, uh, uh, measurements are valuable. One, they can help get better at orbits on these objects. So if it's a fourth or a fifth or a sixth measurement on a known object, that only helps us to get better orbits. So that's a good thing. Depending on the type of measurement as well, it can help us to characterize the object. So there's um, activities called, there's things you can do called taking phase curves of an object or taking light curves of an object. You basically track it over an evening and you take certain types of measurements. And that helps you derive things like albedo, spin rate, and size. So you're not actually directly, you're not taking a direct Im image of it and, and measuring it with a ruler and saying it's this size. You're deriving some of those, um, some of those um, important characteristics of an asteroid from these from these, um, the way that it changes over time with phase and light, these light curves. So um, that's what 2% or so of the total observations reported in 2013. You can see it's pretty dark down here compared to up here, northern hemisphere versus southern hemisphere. One of the reasons why um, NASA decided to come to the International Space Apps Challenge and be here in Australia was to do outreach to individuals in Australia to just show them how um, important this activity is and also increase awareness of the role that amateurs across the globe, specifically in the Southern Hemisphere, can play to help in um, achieving this grand challenge for humanity. And it's not just the work of professionals. Individuals around the globe can get involved as well. Which takes me to who we think these potential contributors are. This is just a, a, a quick list of uh, the types of people we think can play a unique role in finding all asteroid threats to human populations and knowing what to do about them. You might say, me in Hollywood? What? <laughs> like, what? How, do they, how do they play? Many of you probably think about asteroids when you think about Bruce Willis. <laughs> or uh, and I think about Liv Tyler and that Aerosmith song. Um, <laughs> Hollywood has a huge influence on perception of threat, risk, opportunity, and excitement. And so NASA has had brainstorming sessions with folks in Hollywood, both from the TV, uh, movie, documentary, and writing side, well, sci-fi writers, to think about ways in which you reintroduce asteroids into popular culture so that they're not seen as a, a scary thing, but an opportunity, and something that folks are intrigued about it because we have short memories. Humans is just generally a species has a short, have a short memory. Um, and I've talked a bit about how um, we see some small business entering into this uh, phase with people like Planetary Resources, Deep Space Industries. A, a great story here is a last year's Space Apps event, which was um, held in 75 cities across the globe. There was also, um, was there one in Gold Coast last year? I know there was one in prison. Um, the one in New York, I was at the one in New York last year, and there was this guy, James Wagner, that came to that event, and there was a Google group that was set up in advance before the event, and he was coming by himself. He didn't really know anyone else there. There were about 300 people that were going to be coming to that event. So he decided to email the list server they created in advance and said, guys, I want to work on the, the Asteroid Hunter Challenge. There was an Asteroid Hunter Challenge as well. It was asking people to put together concepts for CubeSat small spacecrafts that could go out and characterize them, like scan an object and find out more about that object in space. And he was planning to use open hardware, some Arduino. He had some Arduinos, he had some Raspberry Pis, he had some quadcopters, he had some hardware he was going to bring with him. And so he sent an email to the listserv and said, guys, I want to put together a team that's going to build an autonomous quadcopter to simulate or kind of be an analogy to what a CubeSat could be in space for scanning um, the side of an object and plug it into a 3D printer and do this all in 48 hours. Kind of <laughs> crazy time. But he had 12 people that joined, that jumped in on the listserv to join his team. And they had this whole like system integration team in the corner of uh, this startup accelerator in um, New York working on that particular, that particular problem. And I was a judge at that event last year. And at the judging, they flew their quadrocopter autonomously. And it came up and scanned like uh, a textured wall with sonar and then sent the model back to the computer that they could print out through a 3D printer. They did that in 48 hours. 
And what was amazing about that is James Wagner got so excited about what he was able to do and so excited about asteroids, he started a company called Gotham Labs, and now he's competing for work with NASA on the asteroid mission. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy, but it's awesome. So there's a few tools that we are using in order to get people involved, and enable people to get involved in these types of activities. Um, the first is public-private partnership. So we recognize that it's not just NASA paying through contracts or NASA paying through grants a lot of the time that ends up in that. Public-private partnerships are not a new thing. They've been around for a long time. They've actually been used for quite a while to build infrastructure, um, like telecom or bridges and dams or roads. Public-private partnerships are pretty common in structure, but not something that we've used a lot in space. Um, though recently, I'm sure everyone in the room has heard of SpaceX. Who's heard of SpaceX? Elon Musk. Most people. Um, that actually, uh, his company um, and uh, Boeing and Sierra Nevada and Orbital Sciences, we have had public-private partnerships with those companies um, for the last several years to help them build capabilities to take cargo and crew to low Earth orbit. Now that NASA is no longer flying the shuttle, that wasn't to say that, okay, we're not going to fly the shuttle because that's just not something you know, NASA's going to do anymore. We decided instead to support a commercial industry for cargo and crew uh, resupply to low Earth orbit and entered into public-private partnerships to demonstrate the capability of industry to provide those services to government so we could buy them from a competitive market as opposed to having to do them ourselves, operate that space transportation ourselves. So NASA does have experience with public-private partnership, but in this particular problem area, uh, for, uh, for asteroid hunting, there's a group called B612 Foundation. B612 is the name of the asteroid that the little prince in that children's book, mm -hmm. um, what he lives on. Uh, so they named themselves B612 after that particular um, asteroid in the children's book. Um, they, their whole mission is to protect the planet from asteroids. And they've been around for a long time. It's a former astronaut, Ed Liu, and he is super passionate about this topic. So he wants to go out and crowdfund a telescope to do this, $400 million telescope to do this. They call it Sentinel. It'll be in a Venus-like orbit around, uh, there's the Earth, there's Venus, there's Sentinel. Um, the reason the Venus-like orbit is important is you get a full view of the Earth. So you don't have blind spots like we have on Earth. You can't look, you can't observe in the direction of the sun. So this gives you the ability to get truly a full sky survey. So NASA's in a partnership with B612 to provide them technical assistance, testing, validation, uh, and expertise on their spacecraft concept, this particular one. Incentive prizes. So this is a big part of my, my job, is designing incentive prizes for NASA. Uh, the XPRIZE Foundation, um, which um, launched a challenge in 1999 called the Ansari XPRIZE, that some of you guys may have heard of, um, the Ansari X Prize was a $10 million prize um, that challenged, um, challenged the world, someone, to build a reusable suborbital spacecraft um, that could fly, basically get to suborbital uh, space, land, and then redo the same task within two weeks because they wanted to show that it was um, a reusable spacecraft. Um, and what ended up coming out of that challenge, someone won it, what ended up coming out of that particular prize competition is the first version of Spaceship One, which is what um, uh, Richard Branson and Virgin Galactic acquired as the, basic, as the basis of the technology for their uh, Virgin Galactic suborbital space tours and flights that are going to be starting uh, within the next couple years. So uh, that literally broke open an entirely new potential marketplace and um, uh, broke open space tours as a feasible, um, as, as, as potentially a feasible um, new business, new economy. And that's not the first time prizes have been used to do that. And um, you guys probably heard of Charles Lindbergh, guy that flew across the Atlantic. What most people don't know is that he was flying across the Atlantic to win a prize called the Ortiz Prize. It's a $25,000 prize that was offered at the early part of the 1900s. A lot of people died trying to do that. I say that there are four reasons why people participate in prizes. Gold, guts, good, and glory. Gold is only one of them. Reasons why people participate, you can bet Lindbergh, it was all about being like the baddest guy in you know, the United States. It wasn't so much about the money. Yeah, the money, but that was a gut 
that's a challenge. That was totally a guts challenge. And that, that flight was not just you know, a guts challenge for the people that sponsored it, the ORT that sponsored it. It was about showing that flying across the Atlantic was an actual reasonable form of transportation. You didn't have to do it on ships all the time. That actually flying across the Atlantic is a, is a reasonable and safe form of transportation. Which now we do that all the time. Right? We, fly, we fly across the water all the time. Changing paradigms. Crowdsourcing, um, most people point to things like Wikipedia as uh, one of the early examples of crowdsourcing. Basically asking the crowd to input something into something that's uh, a greater good. Um, we at NASA uh, tap into crowds um, through online platforms to solve problems quite a bit. We've been doing that since 2008. I'll talk about one particular thing that we've got going on um, that $35,000 US dollars is up for grabs if any of you are coders or developers. You could win that money if you win the, you win the challenge. Um, but we'll post challenges on online platforms like Top Coder and Innocentive and uh, some of these open innovation platforms where people from around the globe register to them and participate in challenges. And then we award uh, uh, the, the prize to the best solution that meets our minimum performance criteria. And then citizen science. So this is not really anything new. Citizens have been doing science for a long time. Operation Moonwatch, this is actually something that they had in the early uh, 20th century where folks were literally taking observations of the moon. Um, uh, as we were still learning about um, the moon. Now you see citizen scientists um, uh, uh, doing a lot of different types of science. One of my favorite examples is this group called Public Lab. And they combine all sorts of cool stuff together in order to, um, in order to do, do what they do. They will post on Kickstarter crowdfunding campaigns for a particular sensor. Like say they want to develop a spectroscopy device to measure like water quality and a riverbed. Um, they like to develop uh, these sensors, low cost sensors, like 10, 20, 30, 40 dollar sensors. Some of them are paper sensors, literally where it's like you put a quarter of a DVD and then they, they give you a way to hold the paper and put it on the end of your camera. Super low cost sensors. And then they have some that are much more like hardy that are actually metal and they're a little bit more expensive. Um, but they will crowdfund the development of those sensors and as part of funding it, you get a sensor when they're done. And so that's also their sales, it's their sales and distribution um, uh, channel. But then as folks take the measurements, they have a central spot where they collect all the data for that. And they've got a big open data set of a variety of different environmental measures um, across the globe. And, and, and in fact, after the oil spill in the U.S. Um, a few years back, the public labs folks using um, balloons and rowboats and their sensors and um, regular cameras were able to go out and image that, um, uh, that spill site um, more quickly and more accurately than anybody else using cheap citizen science generated measures. So we think that's a good thing. And we want to be able to harness them, right? Equip people, enable people, allow people to contribute, and actually enable them to do what they're doing better. So the International Space Act Challenge happened this past weekend. This is another example of the way that people um, can get involved. In this particular challenge, this is different because we weren't paying money to the winners. And this was more of a mass collaboration. So we were challenging people around the globe to get together on the same weekend and tackle 40 different challenges, um, ranging from topics in earth science to uh, technology in space. So there was like CubeSat concepts there, to asteroid topics. Um, these were the different asteroid challenges that um, we offered this past week, and to robotics, and challenge people to create in 48 hours. So that um, example that I gave earlier about James Wagner, who built the autonomous quadcopter that I had on video, like just it blew, like it's kind of creepy. Um, uh, it, that, uh, this challenge is a way for people to come together around these topics. And there's no money up for grabs, but there is global recognition. So they just uh, nominated uh, two local winners to vote for global judging, and there will be five global winners uh, that from around the globe, uh, five solutions are selected that become that year's winners uh, for the Space Apps Challenge. And in this particular uh, 
uh, uh, event this year. I was here, so these are some images of what happened this weekend. Uh, these are the participants in the Brisbane um, Space Out Challenge. You'll actually see it was a ton of students that participated in Brisbane, and that's because I think they hosted it at QUT, and a lot of the marketing was done through the university, so you have a ton of students that participated in Brisbane. Um, and Gold Coast, you had a lot more companies and adults that <coughs> participated. And that might be due to the fact that it was a startup group that was uh, running uh, the Space Apps Challenge here in Gold Coast, marketing to a different group, and also different types of folks. Your population looks a little different in Gold Coast than it does in Brisbane. I found out yesterday, I'm talking with these folks. <laughs> but you see here is the winners, the winning teams. Um, Team Nubis here, they created a wearable technology um, for uh, uh, people that are will be flying on um, uh, that will be flying on uh, commercial uh, suborbital space tourism flights in the coming years, like on Virgin Galactic. For them to wear a set of glasses that you can see, you can basically when you look out the window and you're looking at stars, instead of being like, oh, that's pretty, it'll actually tell you what the star is, or it'll map the constellation. Or if you look down to the Earth, it'll show you the boundaries of countries or maybe mountain ranges. So it's kind of like, and the guys are in the back, if they can raise their hand. Those are the winners of, of Gold Coast Space Apps yesterday. Um, they built it. Like, I looked through that thing yesterday. This was built. Like, you could actually look. They put the data in there. They built the, head, the, the, the headpiece. Um, our first runner-up was from TechSpace, and he took he put on a completely different topic. So he said, how could we use open hardware to build a network of telescopes, backyard telescopes, um, that could be centrally controlled and used for follow-up observations. So using open hardware, using Arduinos and other technologies that they use in Tech Shop, how might we create low cost, a low-cost way to network a bunch of people's telescopes in their backyard, and all they need to do is point it at due north, and then the system takes care of the rest. They're observing in their backyard without even realizing that they're contributing to the goal on for asteroids, um, as long as they set up their telescope in the way prescribed by the system. And then we're out. Our second runner up um, in uh, Gold Coast yesterday. He, this is him so excited when he saw that there was a NASA meatball, which is what we call our logo, um, on the award that he got. <laughs> he was so excited to have something from NASA. So excited. You can see it in his face. <laughs> I love it. Um, love it. And he came with a completely different skill set. And what he did is came up with a concept for how we might. Um, uh, increase awareness of science and the beauty of science and the relevance of it through integrating a lot of uh, visuals and imagery into electronic concerts, like the electronic music type concerts and festivals that happen around the globe. Um, so thinking about integrating kind of art and science and technology together to reach a broader population. Love it. Love the diversity of the ideas that came in through. Um, Our solution is the big. Um, love the diversity of ideas that came in through um, all of uh, these events um, yesterday. And it'll be really interesting to see what happens with global judging. There will be a public voting part of that. So as soon as they got them all up online, you guys can go and vote for the Australian ones that are there. If you want to see someone from Oz be in the top five, um, I highly recommend that you do that. Um, what I'm going to show you next is a video uh, for the Asteroid Data Hunter Challenge. It's quick. It's only two minutes. Um, this is a top coder challenge, it's one of our crowdsourcing activities, um, that we have um, recently launched, and the first marathon match for it, so the first big opportunity to win money, comes up on the 18th, on the 18th, April 18th. So mark your calendars if you're a coder or a developer or someone that um, is good with data. Um, and this is one way, one part of the big problem, the big abstract problem that we have decomposed a way where people with a specific skill set set can make a meaningful contribution. And that is in helping us to build better algorithms, to parse through the ground-based observatory data that our professionals are taking. They usually identify moving objects through an algorithm-based approach. But we're hoping to do that algorithm-based approach better while minimizing false positives. So this next video will give you a little bit of a uh, view about what that challenge is all about. And mm -hmm. I encourage you to register for it at topcoder.com backslash asteroids if you're if you have a skill set that you think could contribute to this particular challenge. Our solar system is filled with asteroids. While most like to hang out in the asteroid belt, roughly between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, many have orbits that come close to or sometimes even impact Earth. 
With asteroids being the most plentiful objects in our solar system, you'd think it'd be easier to find. But if you look at the night sky, even with a powerful telescope, the best you're going to get is a small dot that looks just like a star. Well then, how do scientists find asteroids? They compare a series of telescope images to see if anything in the future moves relative to the others. If it does, then it might be an asteroid. Scientists used to use comparison by hand, but there is now so much data that they need to use computer algorithms to sift the data to try to make these initial detections. If they spot something, the scientists will then review the results to make sure it's accurate. And now, there are two potential issues with this process. One, if the computer misses something, then that asteroid won't get discovered this time around, leading us vulnerable to potential asteroid impacts or missing out on opportunities like mining asteroids for resources. The other is if you turn up the sensitivity on these algorithms, you end up with a lot of detections called false positives, where the computer mistakenly thinks some noise in the image or a speck of dust in the lens of the telescope is an asteroid. This causes a lot more work for the scientists who have to go back over all these images and correct any of those false positives. We need your help to improve the algorithms that are used to detect asteroids without grossly increasing the number of false positives. During these challenges, we will ask you to create algorithms that mimic how humans sort through data to discover asteroids, so organizations like NASA and planetary resources can rely on having the most accurate data in the world. This is why NASA and planetary resources are asking you to help the hunt for asteroids. Join your competitors in the Asteroid Data Hunter Challenge, being launched on the Top Twitter platform, brought to you through the Harvard NASA Tournament Lab. Your algorithm, just like it would help to detect an asteroid headed for Earth, or one of valuable resources that helps fuel future space missions deep into our solar system. Join the challenge today.
And so this goes to show that it's actually something that's accessible to people in all shapes and sizes, at all ages, and at all skill levels, depending on how you structure the way for them to make a contribution. And there are structured ways for them to make a contribution through that particular program. Um, in closing, there's a lot of different ways that we engage the public in problem solving. They actually build real hardware and fly it. This was a Lunarlander challenge. They built this thing in fluid for a $1.65 million prize purse. This is the winning team, um, the Morpheus team uh, from 2011. Uh, we also use prizes, challenges, and competitions to develop software and algorithms, so not necessarily things that have to be built and brought to a demonstration event and tested against each other to see which one wins, but solutions that can be submitted online and then um, a, a judge um, on the other side of that after they've been submitted, so not necessarily requiring you to bring a physical prototype. So in closing, we need your help to protect the planet. I think it's cool that, I personally think it's cool that NASA is giving people an opportunity to participate in this type of activity. And we're constantly looking for additional ways to structure new ways for people to get involved. We're signing new partnerships with people every day. Um, and we want to work with folks around the globe on this problem. So if there's any way that you can think of a project that you might want to work with NASA on to contribute to this, let me know. Or also participate in those types of projects that we've already got out there, that we've already structured, that might be a useful way for you to contribute um, your time or skill set. Follow us on our social media channels. You can find out more about other prize challenge and crowdsourcing opportunities not related to Asteroid. We do a lot on our science, CubeStats, radar, a bunch of different stuff. Um, uh, and uh, participate and learn more about the grand challenge on these websites. So with that, I'm going to close my presentation and kick it back over to you. Thank you very much, Jen. Let's give her a big hand. Let's give Jen a big break before we take some questions. Michael Blumenstein, awful with names. I promised him I wouldn't screw it up. Uh, he's going to talk about a related challenge with Singularity University. Uh, Take it away, Michael, and I'll pull up your, yes. your website. Thank you very much, uh, Gary. Um, here are you. So um, th I just wanted to thank Jen for her fantastic presentation. That was great. And um, the one I'm about to announce is really in the spirit of that um, uh, and actually uh, relates to NASA very closely. So you're probably familiar with Singularity University. Mm -hmm. So um, for those of you who are not aware, um, I know that uh, our students have been sent uh, plenty of, well, at least in the School of ICT, have been sent plenty of notifications about the Singularity University competition. And officially, today I'm here to sort of, um, as part of uh, Jim's presentation, is to launch that um, uh, from, from the Griffith side and also Silicon Lakes. Um, and, uh, and, who I, and I want to thank Silicon Lakes actually for you know, the, the Space Age Challenge and bringing Jen out and all that. And uh, obviously, Silicon Lakes and Griffith University and a few other sponsors have come together to put forward this challenge called the Global Impact Competition um, for Australia. So some of you may not know about Singularity University, where it is, it's basically a, um, a, 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 well, a, a faculty, I suppose, a group, um, a consortium of, uh, in the United States that have come together, and I'll read out their mission statement, is to assemble, educate, and inspire leaders who strive to understand and facilitate the development of exponential advancing technologies to address humanity's grand challenges. And um, the idea is basically that they solicit ideas um, from anyone, really. Um, it can be students, it can be members of the public, it can be anyone that's got an idea um, to put forward to, to address one of the grand challenges with technology. And so, as I mentioned, um, you know, uh, Griffith this year has got behind it, specifically the School of Information and Communication Technology, to try and uh, you know, inspire people to put their ideas down um, and submit them as part of this challenge. So the theme this year is, is basically uh, in relation to climate, environment and energy. And so looking at things like anything from reducing greenhouse gas emissions, deforestation, fossil energy use, or facilitation the adaptation to climate change in any sector. Um, so it could be any type of innovation, and it could be social technology, policy interventions, or social ventures. Um, obviously, it, it's pretty broad, um, but it obviously is in that climate space. Um, so the prize is, and this is the big part, um, it's, it's basically being able to get automatic acceptance into, and to get a full sort of scholarship to attend the Singularity University Graduate Studies Program. And that's worth about $30,000.
and it occurs from June to August uh, this year. And it's at the NASA Research Park in Silicon Valley. <laughs> and so I think this, it, it's a great opportunity for any one person to go over. Um, and you can see uh, hidden away behind a play symbol, Suzanne Tam, who won it last year, um, and who basically flew to the United States and, um, and got to actually create some, some more innovation and expanding the idea that he had uh, in, in, in some fashion through the, the program. So it, it's, it's, I suppose it's once in a, uh, in a lifetime opportunity to actually go to the United States and actually be involved in exponential technology development. So all that needs to be done is um, you, you can go to the website there. I don't know if the, the address is showing. Yep, there you go. So you go to gic.singularityu.org slash Australia. Um, you can go to that and you can have a look at the competition uh, parameters. And of course, you can, you can submit your online submission, which constitutes, I believe, um, just a video, basically, and, and your idea in that space. Um, and it has to be something that obviously, again, goes in the climate, energy, and environment area, but can be technology that underpins that. And it should be a massively scalable project to basically try, think of an idea that can impact millions of people. So it's quite an exciting um, opportunity, and I hope people take advantage of that and have a look at the website and, and uh, circulate to your friends. The, um, the due date is May 9th. Um, for the actual submission, but as I said, it's not an onerous submission. So please do have a look at the rules, and, um, and I look forward to as many people from um, the Gold Coast and particularly Griffith um, putting in their submissions. Now, I would like to say that um, tomorrow we're doing a, a launch, of s an actual launch with Zazan Tam uh, and uh, Dr. Clarence Tam, who's the basically the ambassador for Singularity University in, in Australia, uh, to give a talk, and that's at the Nathan campus. Um, at 5 p.m. in the Sir Samuel Griffith building. So if you need any more information about that, uh, just come and see me afterwards. But um, hope to see you there. And thanks again. Thank you, Jen, for allowing me to take a bit of the time. So mm -hmm. thanks, Eric. Thank you very much, Michael. All right, you look ready for some questions? Yes. Okay. And Let's... don't worry, we're not leaving just a minute. There so, be... And there is refreshments <laughs> outside afterwards. Perfect. So. All right, questions. Go for it. Um, what's the, how do you differentiate between like meteorites, asteroids, comets? Like, I always see these terms thrown around, but I haven't quite understood what the differences are. Generally, a meteorite is um, when it has landed on Earth. So once it's on Earth, meteorites can come from comets or asteroids. Um, but it's generally that what ends up on Earth stuff is a meteorite. Um, Asteroids, comets usually come from a different place too. There's this thing called the Oort cloud. Um, this, this thing blew my mind when I first learned about this. But if you go to the edge of our solar system, there's basically an icy, um, icy sphere around the edge of our solar system that there's a lot of ice balls, uh, future comets, that are kind of hanging in the balance between the influence of two sun or two stars. And occasionally they get bumped in towards our sun. I mean, that's when you see long period comets that start coming in towards the sun. Some make their way around and go back out. Um, some, like Comet Ison, that went around um, the sun around Thanksgiving of last year, and we all saw burn out um, and die. Um, uh, though, though some of them don't make it around the sun. What I find interesting about Ison is it actually started its journey from the Oort cloud well before there were humans on the planet. And we just happened to be alive to see it die, which is kind of crazy. Of space. But their comets, comets tend to be ice balls, they have a lot more water on them, they've got, because there's so much ice, they have these long, beautiful tails. Um, but many times the researchers that study asteroids and comets are the same researchers because they're similar types of moving objects within the solar system. Other questions? Yep? When you take measurements, do you need timing information? Mm -hmm. So you would need, yes, you need location and time. Um, to be able to orient where it is, you need where you are, particularly on the Earth when you take the measurement, as well as where it shows up in the field of view and the time. And your elevation angle as a and timing. Is that what you need? Uh, and a, a few measurements? Yeah, so there's a few different, it depends on if you're just taking a tracking measurement or if you're taking like a follow on characterization measurement. If you're taking a characterization measurement, then you take things like a phase curve or a light curve measurement as well. We also use, the professionals use radar as well to get more information on the shape and size of objects. 
only the special ones get radar on them because <laughs> it's expensive to put Arecibo or Goldstone radar on an object. So um, we will do radar on those that we, we care most about, but that's another data, uh, another type of data point, but not one that amateurs do. That gives you a range. <coughs> What's the accuracy of the measurement? Of the radar measurement? I'm not sure. We can do that as a <coughs> follow-up question. There is another one back here. Yeah, go ahead. Good question. They, hit the, they actually hit the moon all the time. So one of the ways that we know um, how many of them are out there, one of the statistical models that we use to determine how many might be out there is actually the amount of craters on the moon. Because the moon doesn't have an atmosphere like we do to protect it from the impacts. So you see a very dimpled moon <laughs> because it's getting hit all the time. Um, and actually, um, as most of you guys uh, likely have heard before, the moon was actually created by an early cosmic collision from the Earth. Um, so it was a very violent early collision with our Earth of another body. The moon was created by debris from the, that, that particular collision. Um, it gets hit every day. So um, a big one hitting the moon would be a concern to us because the moon is provides a lot of reasons why we even have life on this planet. Um, it creates the waves within our ocean that created the reservoir for life in some ways. So it would be problematic, but we're looking at things generally that come by the Earth. Inclusive of those things, it might be problematic for <laughs> Question about? Um, hi, I'm Karen. Okay. Um, just wanted to know, uh, do you see the square polar ray um, having an impact on like, any air time we go to? Can you say that a little louder? Can you? Oh, the, um, the FM square polar The advent of the square kilometer array? Yeah, yeah. Literally been the biggest telescope in the world. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. It's between Australia and New Zealand. Uh -huh. And it's a multitude of radio telescopes. Oh, that's awesome. I actually yeah. didn't know that one. Yeah, I'd love yeah, to learn more. Out. It's, it's billions of dollars. And, um, I would love to learn more about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So NASA is also working on concepts for array radars. Mm -hmm. uh, Jen, uh, it's a two-part question. Mm -hmm. the number, the part A is um, in relation to the dinosaurs. Now, mm -hmm. we, we, we we have a fairly good idea what happened. We probably don't know exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. um, and we've got any thoughts on that. And then B, um, I know you've got, there are mitigation strategies for for you know asteroids coming close or mm -hmm. you know, whatever that is. What happens if, if something does hit? Is there a really, like a, a, a killer? You know, is there a mitigation once it happens? So, uh, for the first question on the dinosaurs, um, there's some controversy controversy on whether or not it was primarily the asteroid, or if it was something else. There's another researcher in the late 2000s that came out and said she thought that it was mega volcanoes in India that was the primary primary purpose or cause, but she recognizes that an asteroid was certainly part of it. So um, but everyone knows that the asteroid was, was part of it. Most say it was primarily the asteroid that did it, but there could have been other things that compounded the problem. Um, what we do know happened is when that particular asteroid came in, it hit a part of the, the planet that had a high concentration of silica in the soil. And so when that was propelled up in a huge, in a huge jet up after the impact, it basically spread very quickly um, along the stratosphere and created a big reflector surface for the planet. And no light got through for several weeks, basically destroying the food chain. And so it wasn't like the impact and fire and uh, like killed everything within hours, right? It was very much a, a, an initial big impact, literally and then a collapse in the food system, and then it took some time for 75% of species to die off, but um, most, some, some uh, species did survive. Some species of dinosaurs survived, that became modern day birds and um, sea creatures. 
So there were some things that were more um, protected from the particular type of impact. Um, but there, there are certainly, there's always going to be controversy in science. There's always a way, I mean, scientists even say they're part of the way that they do their work is to always question what's currently known as fact. So there will always be controversy in science, but um, most people do believe that it was primarily an asteroid that caused that, though there could have been other contributing uh, factors. And as far as mitigation goes, um, uh, your second question, um, if an impact like that, I mean, depending on the size, right, like I just described, if we're to hit a part of the globe where you had a hugely reflective um, material that was in our stratosphere a week, for weeks at a time, we have a major food collapse issue on our hands. That's a problem for any species. So mitigation for a food collapse would look very different than if you had like a uh, very economically um, important or resource important part of the globe that was impacted by a lot of different types. And so at that point, I wouldn't even say it's mitigation, it's response. And then you have different response uh, strategies depending on you know what what the particular impact looks like. But we're not going to be worrying about a global impactor anytime soon because the work that we've done to know where those are. Um, but certainly, you know, the Russian, if the Russian meteor come down somewhere different, um, it could have also like, came down over uh, over a population, but a relatively unpopulated part of uh, uh, Russia. Could look very different if it was over a bigger city with much more glass. <laughs> New York. <laughs> Other questions?
of one, um, either to be more reflective, so you increase the Yaforsky effect on it, and you actually cause that to move it, or it's, it slightly adds to the mass of the object, which can also have um, a similar shifting effect. So um, those are three. Of course, there's people that are studying the nuclear option, um, but that's not one of the ones that we would say is at the top of our investment list. Um, we want to know where they are early enough that we can use these kind of lower, uh, lower, lower uh, impact <laughs> um, technologies to be able to move it. And in fact, with the asteroid mission that we've got planned, um, one of the one of the mission requirements for the robotic precursor is the mission will do two things. The mission will go and capture an asteroid and bring it back to the orbit just beyond the moon. So it'll be the first time humanity has moved a celestial object. That's pretty cool. Don't worry, it's going to be small. It'll be less than 10 meters. So when now everything you know about the size of asteroids that will burn up on the atmosphere, uh, if, if, if anything went wrong, it will burn up in the atmosphere and lay down. It's not going to be a problem for our planet. But we're going to move something to just beyond the Earth and then um, send a human mission to rendezvous with it. Um, uh, the uh, part of the robotic precursor, you go grab it. There will be a deflection demonstration with that to show, in one concept, there's a defective deflection demonstration with that to show that the science and the theory behind our deflection concepts could work, that a gravity tractor, theoretically, that there's a technology demonstration to go along with it, that it doesn't that work. Because we haven't actually done tech demos on any of those deflection techniques yet in space. All right. Fantastic. Uh, why don't we thank Jen again for coming all the way out from the <laughs>